familiar with HERSP, the, that's the, you know, the health insurance risk sharing plan that we have here in the state of Wisconsin um, that covers in primarily intended to cover people that have a medical condition and as uh, Mr. Luck points out has a, a six month uh, pre-existing condition exclusion to it. The answer is um, no, that, that HERSP still will operate as is, not subject to these rules here. However, an another a part that I wasn't really planning to talk about and I really won't spend any, any serious time talking about it, uh, part of the new federal health care reform is the creation of these so-called federal high-risk insurance pools and those are, and the federal government under the, this part of the federal uh, uh, health care reform is supposed to put these federal health high-risk pools, and that's what the HERSP is, it's a high-risk pool, into, into effect 90 days after the law was passed. 90 days is like nothing in time. And, and the federal government, as a practical matter, is, no, is not going to be able to put a federal high-risk pool for people with medical conditions in place that quickly unless they contract with states to do so. And so they're contracting with states, including Wisconsin's HERSP, to carry out the provisions of the federal health care reform, you know, uh, federal high-risk pool aspect of it here in Wisconsin. So that's only going to apply, though, to people who um, have been denied coverage elsewhere because they have a medical condition. So even though the federal, so, so bottom line, once that contract comes in here to uh, Wisconsin's HERSP, Wisconsin's HERP is going to have two pieces to it. They're still going to have the existing piece that is going to still have a pre-existing condition exclusion for people. But for people who are eligible for the federal high-risk pool, um, and they will qualify for the other piece, which is going to get federal funding. So there are going to be federal dollars coming to HERSP covering people who can get covered under that federal pool, let's say. It'll be through HERSP, but it'll be to the federal pool with no waiting period at all, no pre-existing condition exclusion. But if for some reason you don't qualify for the federal pool, um, then, and you have to, to go under the state pool, you still will be subject to that six month waiting, <coughs> the six month pre-existing condition exclusion if you follow all that. Under the current way HERSP rules, that's true for the most part, but there, there is an, a major exception if you're coming over under a, a HIPAA, it, it covering, coming over from another health plan um, with HIPAA creditable coverage type situation, you're, you can get on the HERSP plan uh, without a pre-existing condition exclusion. You get that same creditable coverage that protects you there against those um, pre-existing conditions in the same fashion as you move from one employer's health plan to another health plan and you have creditable coverage, you can move over to the new employer's health plan without any pre-existing condition exclusion applying there. As long as you can show that prior coverage, that same kind of exception applies to HERSP. But, but if you're not in that category, you're not coming over from another place where you had health coverage and, and you're, you have a medical condition that caused you to be uh, unable to get health insurance, you, so you're able to show two, two denials, two insurance companies that have denied you coverage because of your medical condition, you're quite right. Her, Wisconsin's HERSP will take you on, but, they'll, but as, to that, as to that medical condition, you will not get coverage for, until the six months has expired. But under this federal, the federal version of the high-risk pool, you won't have to have that six-month pre-existing condition exclusion. If you qualify for the federal pool, you'll apply to HERSP, but you'll get, uh, you'll get covered right from day one, even as to your pre-existing condition exclusion, and the funding for that will come from the federal government. So the, the HERSP will change in that respect. But again, this only applies to people with medical conditions that cause them to be unable to get health insurance elsewhere. So it doesn't affect most employers, which is why I wasn't really planning to talk much ab about it uh, specifically. Um, so, so just to kind of move through quickly, because we've got a lot still to cover here, uh, these, these mandates here on this slide, as I said, and the next slide, are um, grandfather plans are subject to these, these mandates, you know, the prohibition on lifetime and and annual limits with some restrictions, pro prohibition on pre-existing condition exclusions uh, for as to children. Tim will talk about that uh, in more detail. Um, prohibition on rescissions, rescinding someone's coverage. Tim will talk about that. Um, and required coverage of adult children. Uh, Tim will talk about that. And this new requirement to provide a summary of benefits and coverage. Tim will talk about that. Um, uh, one other little quick thing I want to mention as to new, new plans, not a grandfathered plan, but a brand new startup plan, they are subject to this first dollar coverage requirement for preventive care, uh, effective, uh, again, at the six-month point, September uh, 23rd, going forward. So 
um, no um, co-pays or deductibles then can be applied to preventive care type expenses as to new plans. Grandfathered plans, you have those kinds of provisions, you can keep those provisions in there. So that will not change six months from now. That's why that first dollar coverage is not on the list on that slide or this slide. It only applies to new plans, not uh, grandfathered plans. And also a new rule regarding a cl ex uh, claim appeal process. Claim appeal process and rules are put in place by the new law, only applicable to new plans. If they were, if they were applicable to grandfathered plans, I would have listed them on this, that sli this, this slide or the previous one, but they're not on this list, so they only apply to new plans. So you don't need to worry about it for now. You can, again, keep, uh, not pay attention to that uh, and keep your information overload uh, to a, a minimum for now. Um, another change, uh, stepping away from the grandfathering issues to another thing that's caught a lot of attention, beginning January 1st of next year, regardless of what your plan year is, uh, even you know mid-plan year, boom, January 1st of 2011, health uh, flexible spending arrangements and health uh, reimbursement arrangements and health spending accounts uh, cannot re can no longer reimburse for over-the-counter uh, medicines or drugs other than insulin unless there is a doctor's prescription for it. Um, I'm not totally sure why the government wanted to make this change because most of these things are intended to have more coverage rather than, than less, but uh, maybe they thought there were some uh, abuses in the situation. Bottom line, the, what will qualify for coverage, it really goes back to the same rules that would apply if someone were to, to make a deduction on their individual tax return, try to take a deduction for, for uh, a medical expense. Right now, over-the-counter drugs, don't, can't, you can't deduct for those. But if you had them covered through one of these plans, you could get it paid for. So this change brings the coverage rule in line with the deduct deduction rule if you're paying for it uh, out of pocket and trying to deduct it. Um, I that someone in Congress didn't like that employees were uh, buying cases of contact lens solution at the end of the year uh, to use up their FSA dollars and they yeah. didn't like, think that was worthy of a tax exemption. Maybe. Dennis? A revenue raiser? Um, that um, could be. Could be. Every, almost, almost everything has revenue impact one way or the other, another, I suppose, in this area. Uh, another thing that's caught uh, some people's attention, but this is not effective until January 1st of 2013, but again, as of that date, regardless of plan year, uh, regardless of any um, uh, grace period. Many health FSAs have grace periods these days that allow people to submit claims, you know, two and a, up to two and a half months after the year is over. Um, that grace period, uh, the way the law is written, seemingly would not help here in terms of this limit. So this, you know, beginning in terms of all uh, claims that would be reimbursed under a health FSA uh, during the calendar year or taxable year is what the, what the law uses the term taxable year, but taxable year kind of reverts back to what is the taxable year of an individual. Individual's taxable years is their calendar, is the calendar year. So beginning, you know, January 1st of 2013, uh, limit of $2,500 on how much uh, employees can uh, get reimbursed for out of a health FSA. And that dollar amount is supposed to be adjusted for inflation after that, that first year. Um, that shouldn't be a problem for most plans unless they're more, you know, on the generous side because uh, most employees wouldn't normally have, uh, you know, even try to seek reimbursements of more than $2,500. But, you know, there are some plans out there that more like $3,000 or $5,000, they'll have to ratchet their, their limits down to, to 2500 beginning 2013 to comply with this uh, law. Question here. She described that if someone had a carryover into the grace period from 2012 to 2013, the grace period could still apply, could still you apply those dollars, but that's going to then count against the 2013 limit of $2,500. So even though it really was dollars that were uh, carried over from the prior year, it's going to count against the 2013 uh, dollar limit. 